Hello. Uh, very excited about today and looking forward to talking with Dr. Yaba Blay. Um, hopefully she will send me a request sooner than later. Um, I hope you guys are doing well. I think that this last week has been so incredible and the work that happened last week with Share the Mic Now when Dr. Blay took over my handle um, here on IG. Uh, it's just been, she says, give me one sec. So we're gonna give her one sec. Um, she's just been awesome. We've been emailing and texting all week, um, talking about what happened and feeling about what happened. Here we go. And here she is coming. Let's hope it works this time. Yes, you're there. I'm so excited. <laughs> and How I look clear. You? Can you hear me? It's clear and I can hear you. Look at us. <sighs> you look great. Thank all you. Together, I'm all put together. I look the exact same every time. <laughs> you know, because my hair has um really grown out during this pandemic my my blonde um so i've got to just hat it up you know <laughs> that's how i get through I how are you. you i'm doing okay um it's just a lot the world is a lot right now and it just seems like every single day is something else you know for all of us and it's a lot i'm tired you know so when i say that i'm tired i'm tired because there's a lot of stuff coming my way, which is a blessing, and I'm thankful for it, you know. Um, but I'm also tired because there's a lot of emotions to manage and nowhere, no outlet. It's not like we can go outside and dance and have a drink or, you know, kick it with each other. And so it's yeah. this continual kind of like solitude, and it feels like constantly like just it's all going in, you know. So got to find a way to manage. But overall, I, I feel good. How you doing? I'm doing really well, and I just want to give a little background. So last week, Dr. Yaba Blay, this is Dr. Yaba Blay. If you were here, you know her. Um, if not, she, I just want to introduce her really quick before we kind of get into our little um, recap and reflection on what happened last week and what's been going on. Um, last hey, week, Andy, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you turn off the comments so the comments aren't scrolling on my face because I'm cute? Yes, totally. How do I do that? I don't know. Let's see. Does anybody know how to turn off the comments? There right here, are. turn off the comments. I did it. Got it? Look at me. I feel so proud. Okay, um, okay. so Dr. Yaba Blay is um, a scholar activist. She's an overall badass. She's now not just a colleague, but a friend, somebody that um, took over my account on last Wednesday for Share the Mic Now campaign. And quite frankly, it was um, a raging success. Many other uh, women, uh, white women, uh, let, let black women take over their IG accounts for the day. And um, I think that the, 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 the stats just came in yesterday. It was 15 mil, sorry, with a B, 15 billion impressions that happened on last Wednesday, which is just, in, it's just it's crazy. incredible. I mean, incredible. Much. And, you know, Dr. Yaba Blay, um, I, mean, I just like the, the Dr. Yaba Blay. It just sounds it's like so a song. good. She's it's got, like a song. It's okay. Got, yeah. <laughs> you've got letters before. You've got letters after your name. I mean, you're a prof you've been a professor at all these colleges. I mean, um, the thing that I find most amazing about you is though you are accomplished and educated and you're out there doing this work, um, one of the things that I value so much is that you are so real and you're not hiding behind any of those letters before or after your name. You are just exactly who you are and you're the kind of woman that needs to be out in front. And that was part of the reason why this campaign was so important to a lot of us white folks is that we know that uh, black women especially don't have um, access as much and, and, and as, as much privilege as we have. So we wanted to lend the very least that we could do uh, an opportunity for you. And I don't know, did you get any more followers from, from your experience? 
Abby, in a week's time, I have gotten like 22,000 followers. Wow. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I posted this meme this weekend because my I could tell my followers, I have a community of folks. Like, I feel like my followers are, are my family. And so I made this post like, hey, y'all, you know, letting them know I got 20,000 new followers. And all of them are like, who are they? Make them get in the back. They're going to take you away from us. It was so funny how they were acting like I brought a new baby home. Like, who are these people? Um, but it's interesting to have 20. I mean, I don't do this for numbers. That's first and foremost, right? So the number of followers is not a measure of any success to me necessarily, right? Um, so my thing is just speaking very directly to new followers is like, welcome. I'm glad something, you saw something that made you want to follow me and see what else I have to say, but also know, and I say clearly and unapologetically that what I've created is a very decidedly black space in terms of my Instagram mm -hmm. spaces. And so what I talk about, what I put, first of all, this is Yaba's page. It's not Dr. Blaze's page. So Yaba can give you anything on any given day. I post what I want, number one, right? Um, but I also am very deliberate about creating a black space, you know, because I see social media as a, a new media and it's a media that we now have control over. Many of us don't even have cable anymore. You know what I mean? We don't have to rely upon the mainstream media and so that we create spaces for, for us to see ourselves. And so my space is a black space where I celebrate blackness, where I talk about things that impact myself and my community and the voices that are going to be privileged and prioritized in this space are black. So read the room before you make a comment, you know, cause you will get checked. And if that means 20,000 of y'all leave and don't follow me, that's cool too. But I'm not going to adjust who I am to make you feel comfortable. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I think that it's important that um, that gets established. A few things just in terms of kind of how this is going to flow. The reason why we wanted to do this is because it was such a success last week. Um, we actually intended to do this on Friday of last week, but we had some internet connections. But I think that that was... Um, I was about to we say, are. are we having a flashback? No, no, no. <laughs> Here we are a week later, and I think that so much has happened in that week and more reflection from, from my perspective, and we're going to get all into it. Um, but first and foremost, I just want to encourage the white folks who are watching. Most of my followers are predominantly white. Um, what we're going to talk about is much of what Dr. Yaba Blay, Dr. Blay, um, posted about and talked about with Toronto Burke on their IG Live that day on, um, on, uh, on this IG Live. And I think for me, this might bring up some stuff for us white folks. And these conversations aren't easy because you know, you know better than most Dr. Blay that the worst thing that a white person can be called is a racist, right? And that's gonna bring up some stuff. Um, some of the things that we talk about here today are hard and emotional and I think that what we need to do especially as those white folks who have been privileged and um, in power we have to listen what we see on the media and the protests and, and all of the things that have been happening in our world recently I think it causes for it's a call for all of us to be able to sit and listen and educate ourselves on what is real because and I'll say this out loud and I've said this um, I am fairly new to this conversation and it's embarrassing to say as a person who was leading uh, our women's national team, I was a captain of our women's national team and I felt like I was a true representative of my country, but I hadn't really done any of this true work that was necessary for me to actually call myself a true captain and a representative of our whole country because I was leaving out, I think, in my mind, because I've, I have been only leading from the perspective of my life and my work. But as a leader, we have to think about the perspective of all, all the people that you're trying to lead, all the people that you're trying to inspire and motivate. So for me, I just want to just encourage those of us who are watching to take a beat when something comes up, right? If you start getting defensive or like, no, that's not me, that doesn't, that doesn't apply to my life, just take a beat. 
right? This is part of our work. This is part of our job as folks who do want to see change happen, but don't know how to start. This conversation right here, right now can be that for you, right? And, and for me, um, I'm just glad I married Glennon. She is the fiercest woman I've ever met. And she has held my hand through this process of uncovering my, uncovering my own internal racism or my own white supremacy in the way that that has shown up in my life. Um, you know, I believe, and I'm sorry, I'm going on a little bit of a rant. I just believe deeply that we are all subject to this. And we have all been conditioned around this, this idea of social norms and these constructs that have been created before we, we were born. So though it might not be our fault, it is our responsibility. And especially as white folks, because we have um, been benefiting from our supremacy of this world. We have to do that work to unlearn and, and educate ourselves, our own selves, before we start tweeting, before we start commenting, because all of that stuff just shows how much or how little work you've really, in fact, done. So, well, let me I say this, Abby, also. Can... Let ahead. me say this, right? I just also want to give you credit, right? I keep giving you credit because I want you to, I hear you often kind of reflect and not beating yourself up, but like rethinking perhaps where you've been. But one thing that stood out to me is in um, after this campaign was over on Wednesday and we had our debrief meeting with the group and you and I text and you said, we're teammates for life, right? And so I appreciate that, that, that metaphor, I guess, because as a captain, as a leader, you take responsibility for a common goal with someone else. It's not about you as the individual and I'm going to win. You telling me that I'm your teammate means that you're on, I'm, I'm listening to you, Abby. You're like my own supremacy, supremacy. I'm like, yes, Abby. Yes. You know, so you take something, you, you hear about it, you sit with it, you think about it and you own it. It doesn't mean it's your fault. Exactly. Like you said, it's your responsibility. So again, I'm giving you credit, Abby. You're getting it. You're getting it. No, I, it's a journey. And, it is a journey and I will say this, this has been years of work, years of reading, years of listening. And also, by the way, years of making mistakes. You know, I've been, I have not been perfect in this process and nor will you or anybody else be. Um, but what I will do is continue to commit to it. That's the most important thing because I do see a future, a better future not just for the world, but for my own self, because, um, and you probably would know who, who the exact person was that said this, I'm actually doing myself a disservice, right? Because if I don't do this work, then I am oppressing my own self, my own vision, my own life. Limiting and I think self. that, yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's talk about one of the things that you posted um, early on in, in the day that you took over my IG. I want to talk about the definition of racism a little bit. Um, I thought that what you post was really fascinating. And, um, and I think that most white folks, like I said, it's the worst thing you can be called is a racist, but like you posted, and it was the first time I'd ever had this thought, how many times have, have you ever sat down and really thought about what the definition of racism really means? And I, I mean, I'm sure you, you have thought about this more than me, but I thought about it all week. And I want to talk a little bit through that with you, my thoughts and my feelings, right? Because I think that a lot of folks, white folks, especially, we don't want to touch this thing with a 10 foot pole. But then again, we don't want to spend any time thinking about what it actually means. Um, so for me, my definition of racism is the, the power and the prejudice mixed. Um, racism is this, it's not just about uh, oppressing a specific race. It's also about power. And I think that that power element is completely left out of, you know, in fact, the definition that, that is written in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. It's trying to get changed right now. This woman, um, she, she's trying to get them to expand that definition to include this, this power element. But for me, I just, um, and, and look, like, let's let this be a conversation. Like, 
why did you post that? And why do you think it's important for, especially us white folks, to define what racism is? I posted that because, you know, in my work in black studies, even in women's and gender studies as a black woman, racism is a term that is completely overused in this country, right? Mm -hmm across the board, people are constantly saying, and I'm not just saying white people, I'm saying all of us, this is racist, that's racist, this is racism, and it very well could be, but again, as an educator, as someone who could get a first year student in my classroom, I can't start the semester presuming that my students know what racism means. So then when the first question is, what is racism? And you can't answer it, right? Or you fumble around it, I know that you've, again, you've never had to sit down and talk about it. You've never had to think about the various ways in which it actually impacts our lives. And therefore, racism becomes the problem of individuals. I had one student say, I know it when I experience it, or I know it when I see it. And it's like, that's not necessarily the case. Or the one that really gets me is when you hear folks say, uh, reverse racism, right? Just in the fact that you said reverse means you recognize that it goes in one direction, right? <laughs> but in defensiveness, oh, that's reverse racism. Again, you don't know what the term means. At one point in time, I, I want to say maybe 2011, 2012, we start hearing the notion of a post-racial and what the hell is that, right? Post-racial. And so again, I just feel like racism, even in your, and I want to ask you, this power and prejudice definition that you came up with, or as you reflect on it, is that how you would have said it before last week? Um, probably not. Um, truthfully, I mean, and I just thought that I knew what racism meant. You know, I never actually put uh, much time into considering, because I thought that that's what the work was. I thought that that's what I was trying to figure out, but I actually wasn't specifically trying to go after that definition. And I think that that's like a really important starting place, especially for folks who don't know where to start. It's like, okay, you have to go to the beginning, right? Yeah. To, to, to be able to uncover anything that's going on inside of you. Um, figuring out that definition and, and, you know, Glennon is like so versed on this and she's done so much more work than I have. And so she's further along the, the spectrum than I. And, and so we, we've talked about it all week. And I think that it's so fascinating because as a white person, I have heard and I have, um, I have been a part of conversations and situations where that, that reverse racism comes up and people talk about it. It's like, it's like the thing that um, that white folks kind of lean on as defensiveness against. Oh no, I'm not racist because well, there there's there's this thing called reverse racism, but you can't have reverse racism because the power element. White folks are in power, and and so you can't be racist if you don't have power because you need the prejudice along with the power, and I think that when I started breaking that down and started to get really honest about it. You know, a lot of this work that I'm doing is just about getting really the, the, to down to the truthiest truth mm -hmm. about this stuff. Um, so let me jump in, cause I'm, yeah. I, I'm jumping, I'm jumping. Go. Just okay? jump whenever, yeah. This is why I don't use the language of racism. Cause even just to say power and prejudice, the individual will say, I'm not in power, I'm poor. I'm working class. I only make $20,000 a year. I don't own a house. I'm not as rich and privileged as you, Abby. I'm not privileged, right? Mm -hmm. It's too loose. Mm -hmm. And it's completely decontextualized from history. Mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about power, we're talking about historical power. We're talking about institutional power. We're talking mm -hmm. about systemic power that you benefit from simply based upon how you look. Right. So again, I don't watch enough football, soccer to know. Right. But let's say you had a black woman on your team who was just as bad ass as you for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. We're going to make a decision between Abby and this black woman. Mm -hmm. And if what it means to be a captain means to be the face of America, to be on the billboards and on the, all the, the assets, we're going to go with Abby. It doesn't matter that the black woman is more badass than Abby. 
it's about what it looks like and what it represents ultimately, right? And so again, when I posted the definition of white supremacy, why I continue to lean on white supremacy is because it gets very specific about what type of power we're talking about, right? And it's a historical power and, and institutionalized and it tells us who should have power. Listen to the language. Who should have power and who should not? It's not just who does and who doesn't, who should. So if we're picking between Abby and this black player, Abby should be the captain, mm -hmm. right? Because that's more mm -hmm. representative of America, right? Mm -hmm. Or Abby might, you know, looking at this screen, Abby, your white face, and you pretty white, blonde hair, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My black mm -hmm. face, and I'm pretty black, and kinky hair, the two of us on this screen, if we were silent, people would make different assumptions about you than they would about me. And I yeah. could be more educated, more successful. I could be you richer. Are. You are I could, educated. Hush, hush now. I could have so much more than you. But if we were to play a game and say, who is this person with all of these accolades and all these things? And then who is this person who is struggling trying to find her way? It's almost like a natural response to give the power and the accolades and the privilege. Of course, you're going to be better than me. You're white. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of thinking and training that white supremacy puts on us all. And so when I talked earlier about this notion of owning it, it's not just about avoiding being called racist, because this is the other thing. And let me be a, a completely clear. I'm very happy and very thankful for the new followers for the exposure that I gained from this campaign. I'm very thankful for the support that you've given me. But let me also be clear that your folks are coming to us for answers. They're coming in their inboxes for answers. They want us to help them find a way, right? And on the one hand, the language is like, I want to do better. I want to be a better person. You might, but ultimately, you don't want to get in trouble. A lot of times when companies call me in to consult, they literally will say, we have this huge, massive problem. We'd like you to come in for an hour to talk. What the hell can I say in an hour? What can I say in an Nothing. hour? And so what you want me to do is you want me to come in with a printed checklist on how not to be called racist. Mm -hmm. You're not owning it. You're not trying to critically mm -hmm. think about it. You're not trying to engage it. You just want to put the checklist on the wall and say, well, I didn't do that today. I didn't do that today. I'm never going to do that. See, I'm not racist. But you don't even know how to think critically about what racism is because you've never had to sit down and engage it. And even when you do, in so doing, it's for the express purpose of avoiding it. That's different than digging in it. You understand what I'm saying? So this is so good. Yeah, it's so good because it's, it's again displaying our own white supremacy, especially trying to slide into you, your, your DMs. Help oh, me, fix oh, me. Oh, or let me say something else. Right? Let me say something else. Because again, I told you, I'm an independent people's worker. I'm happy that your people want to give me their money and they want to support me. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Trust me. Thank you. But at the same time, when we start talking about intersectionality, which is white supremacy, which is gender, which is capitalism, Americans, Mm -hmm. White people, I need you to know that your money will not assuage you from your guilt. You cannot pay your way out of this. There aren't enough reparations mm -hmm. in the world that you can pay us. And so you think because you write a check or you slide me something in Venmo that you're absolved and you can tell somebody, well, I gave Dr. Blay $100. I'm not racist. Dr. Blay is going to spend your $100 and still tell you that you're racist. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. And so, again, you can't buy your way. This is not about because, again, and I'm sure my, my black colleagues around the world can attest to this. There is something about this moment. Your people are antsy. They're antsy. We're all getting calls. We're getting booked. They want us on the show. They want us to consult by Zoom. They're antsy. Where's the fire? Why do you want to do it right, 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 right now? When you've had you've had up, we can do it. But where's the fire in this moment? All of a sudden. You don't want to be racist? What happened? You know what I'm saying? And so again, my thing is like, slow down. 
So if you call me in to consult, in the same way if you were to call a medical doctor in to come explain some, you know, cancer or some kind of disease that people were experiencing, you wouldn't expect him to wrap it up in an hour. Respect this work. Respect that there are people who have studied and trained and, and, and learned about this in a way that we can now translate it for you to understand. It's about value. And again, for me, it all comes back to white supremacy. Why would you value black lives? Why would you value black history? Why would you value this information that ultimately holds you accountable? Why? Yeah. What's, it, what's in it for you? So when you slide in my DMs, and ask me for help or ask me to respond to something or to, to make a comment or what's your opinion, my question is, what's in it for me? Why should I help you? Why should I care that you don't want to be racist anymore? What's in it for me if you're just doing it to get the information and you get to go back to your privileged racist ass life? What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Even if you pay me, if you're not going to commit to actually changing your life and doing something different in this world, leave me alone. Because now it's sport. It's entertainment. You just want to know. You're just curious. I do this work because it's to change the life of the people who look like me. I do this work for a reason. It's not just for money. I'm trying to change my life, the life of my daughter, the life of my granddaughters, the life of my family, the life of my friends, the life of my community, the life of my world. This isn't for money or for sport. So this isn't about you just being entertained. Oh, Dr. Blade, tell me what you think. Why? I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's just so interesting. And I know, and I'm talking a lot, but my point is this. This is beyond memorizing definitions. This is about critical thinking. This is mm -hmm. about questioning everything, everything. And I'll say one of the highlights of my week, Abby, is I've heard from like four of my former students that I taught at predominantly white institutions who hit me up like, yo, you're right. Like you used to tell us that we thought you were just talking smack but you used to tell us it was a privilege to be in your classroom we were like oh whatever dr blay but on the back end of this recognizing again like you always say most people don't have an opportunity to sit in a classroom and dialogue about race about history about things that will impact you and so now they're grown now they're working in white corporate america now they're working in the real world and they're like yo i actually wish i could come back to class because I have more questions now that it's, I'm watching it play out in my life. You know, yeah. I have students, black students who are brilliant, who have had to bring up um, discrimination cases against employers. And I know I can certify that they're brilliant, but they were being treated a particular way because of their race and or because of their gender and or because of their sexual, like, it's a lot. Yeah. I get it. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that you just said, I think we should talk about, um, I think that white people don't know what to do. And so the guilt, the white guilt thing that's happening, they're Venmoing you or sliding in your DM, DMs, like, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I? What Can you help me understand? Things? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Abby. Can you help me understand okay. this feeling of guilt? What you feel guilty about? What's that mean? Well, because I think that on, from a very deep level, um, I think that all of us white folks know that our, our ignoring of this for over 400 years and our benefiting from this is something that I don't know from like a, a core soul level. Um, folks can actually say, hmm. see, and want to acknowledge really truly exists. And so there's just this, this, this thing that can cover some of that shame. Hmm. And that shame is that, that guilt, right? Right. So for me, so language, I'm, language, again, shame, I understand. Yeah, yeah. And, we, we can stay there. I understand you should be yes. and not as an individual. No, right, right. 
right? But from a from a lineage, right? From from ancestors, and, and not even I'm not even going to talk about that. What's interesting to me, and I, and I, and I say about white supremacy, why I need white people to own it is because I need you to understand how white supremacy also disenfranchises you, yes. how it disempowers you. And I mean, from a spiritual level, yes. from a human level, white supremacy yes. robs you of your humanity. It yes. robs you of the ability to fully see yourself. It gives you a fake script and a fake mask to wear that many people can't even live up to, or you yeah. don't even know that you're wearing. You know what I mean? So I understand mm -hmm. the shame. And so being invested in white supremacy is to say, first you have to acknowledge, because this is the thing with the reverse racism and it's not me and all this. You haven't even sat still and shut up long enough to acknowledge that that history is a problem and that that history mm -hmm. is still something that you benefit from. Stay there. When you say, what should we do? Sit still for a minute. First and foremost, mm -hmm. stop arguing with folks. Stop redirecting. Stop being defensive. Do you know yeah. history? My thing is don't say anything until you know this history. Argue with me about Christopher Columbus. Mm -hmm. Argue with mm -hmm. me about enslavement. Argue with me. Mm -hmm. We're not going to argue about right mm -hmm. now and whether or not somebody should have been shot or what they did to, to make the police feel whatever. Let's go back to Christopher Columbus. What's your argument again? Mm -hmm. What's your argument about enslavement? Let's mm -hmm. start there. Because mm -hmm. everything, it's almost like it just, what's the word I'm looking for? Devolves from that place. Yes. And so it's why it's so important for us to learn history. So then there's a great book. I've given presentations on it. And there are many more great books. But what's coming to mind in this moment is Lies My Teacher Told Me. Mm. Read it. Yes. Lies My Teacher Told Me. Because again, I, so I mentioned this, I think, in the conversation with uh, Tarana. When we start talking about definitions, when we even start, imagine if the president of your country was responsible for writing the history of Barack Obama's presidency. What history would your grandchildren be reading about Barack Obama? Understand that human beings wrote books, human beings with right. opinions and ideas. So just because mm -hmm. it's printed in a book doesn't make it fact. Just because it's called History doesn't make it fact. Again, critical thinking, right? So let's sit still, let's learn history, and then let's understand how it is that we got to this place. Because my thing is like, if you come at me with some reverse racism, if I'm going to be 100% real, again, given that history, why should I like you? Right. And it's not even about liking. You shouldn't. It's not even yeah, about you liking. You shouldn't. It's not even about liking because the other thing is these race conversations end up being we are the world. I was driving here and saw a billboard that said love one another. That's cute. But before you can get to like, before you can get to love, you have to get to trust. Why should I trust you, white people, given yep. this history that you won't even acknowledge? Mm -hmm. So what if I don't like you? What are you going to do? Like, again, we don't have this conversation within certain groups. You wouldn't ever say to a Jew, get over it. Somehow you acknowledge something about the Holocaust. And again, this is not comparative. I am not trying to compare trauma. Hist I'm not. I'm not. But what I'm saying to you is white supremacy has programmed you in such a way that you read the trauma experienced by people who are received as white differently than the trauma received by people who are not. You somehow yes. value, for lack of better words, the Holocaust more than you value hundreds of years of enslavement and colonization. You respect Jews and that history. We've got museums erected. You know that a swastika is a problem, but we're gonna debate about the Confederate flag? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so that's what I mean by white supremacy. It is programming you to even think about history in a particular way. It is programming you to write about history in a particular way. Who, because even history, if we understand that people are writing the history, which histories get to be written? Mm -hmm. Or when we watch the daily news, which stories get to be told? Right? And again, yeah. let me just throw out, I'm not, I'm, I promise I'm going to shut up. I'm on a roll. Though. No, don't. So when I think about this moment with people in all of their statements, right? Because I've gotten hit up by a few companies and brands who want help 
drafting these statements. And I'm like, enough with these statements. Don't you know that black people are side eyeing you? We all side eye your <laughs> statements. We don't care nothing about these statements. Because what you value, you do. You wouldn't have to make yes. a statement. I would know because you do, right? I don't care what yes. you want. What do you do? So it doesn't matter. So for example, our good friends at Instagram, hopefully they don't cut mm -hmm. us off for me saying this. I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed, but sometimes when you log in, well, at least last week when I would log in, I would see this thing at the top with a black Instagram logo that would say, we stand with the black community in regards to everything mm -hmm. that's happening. And I'm looking at it like, how Instagram? Because what I know is somebody who manages another page with a high following, you police black pages much more than you do white ones. Ugh. You police us. You enact your so-called community guidelines on us more than you do white pages. You won't even allow us to hold you accountable in whatever way we choose to on our pages because all it's gonna take is 10 white people to say, I'm offended. I feel some uh -huh. type of way, let's report this. And all it uh -huh. takes is enough of y'all to get together and report it and here come Instagram telling me that my post violates community guidelines when you will allow folks to slide in my DM and call me a nigger and I report uh -huh. that and you don't do anything about it? Or you allow people to have all kinds of racist stuff on their pages and we report them and you, you, you say that it doesn't violate your guidelines? Keep your statements, mm -hmm. dog. Keep your statements. Mm -hmm. We don't want your statements. Mm -hmm. We want you to act mm -hmm. right. Okay, so, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I love all that. <laughs> I got excited. I think that, I think something that came up for me during that in terms of the difference between shame and guilt I think shame looks backwards and guilt can look forwards. Hmm. So maybe white folks who feel guilty when they're trying to slide in your DMs and pay you money is that they know themselves that they're probably not going to do all the work to repair the shame. Hmm. Um, you know, I think that everything that you just said, I mean, it rings so true and the experience of a white person is vastly different in this country and world um, to the, the experience of a black woman. And I know you do a lot of work with body politics. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that and what that means. And um, if you could just share with, with these folks what that means and, and um, that's it. I mean, I'm just, I'm very curious. Okay. You tired? I wore you out? No. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's interesting, for example, I um, am trained in Black Studies, like I said, but because Black Studies is interdisciplinary, we, many of us scholars, work in a variety of departments, right? So in my last position, I worked in a political science department. I'm not a, pol I'm not a political science person. I don't even think I ever took a political science class in undergrad. Right, but I was positioned in political science because of the ways I approach my work. So usually if I ask my, my students, right, if I say, I taught a class called the politics of hip hop. I've taught a mm. class called the politics of gender, right? What do those words, we hear that a lot, particularly in academic spaces, people, it sounds sexy. People say the politics of embodiment, you know, or the politics of race. What does that mean? So any, for me, just in a very basic, how I'm gonna explain it to you way. Anytime I say the politics of something, it means that there are negotiations of power at play. Mm -hmm. So if I say we're mm -hmm. gonna talk about the politics of hip hop, this is not a music appreciation class. We're not gonna go over lyrics. We're gonna talk about the history and the social context in which hip hop was birthed and what was happening politically, what was happening in the world that required black people, because hip hop is a resistance movement. It's not just about a, a hard beat. You know what I mean? When we look at its origin, folks were resisting, not just here, but in the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. And so the politics of hip hop is something different than let's say the music aspect, if that makes sense, yeah? So when I say the politics um, or body politics or the politics of skin color, or the politics of hair, hair politics, um, we're talking about the negotiations of power at play. So for example, mm. the politics of skin color. Language again, a lot of people will use the language of colorism, which is applicable. I tend to use the language politics of skin color. 
Because colorism, mm -hmm. a lot of times, people only understand in one direction, right? When we talk mm -hmm. about negotiations of power, we understand how it works across the spectrum. It's not just about dark skin versus light skin. It's about how does your skin color make meaning in the context of white supremacy? How does your skin color take meaning? Again, you and I on the screen, my dark skin reads very differently. My kinky hair reads very differently than yours. So when we talk about the politics of hair for many communities, us getting our hair straightened, us wearing weaves, us all kinds of body modifications, skin bleaching. Now we see women getting all kinds of body modifications. Body. It's about the politics. It's about the power. It's about I'm going to change something about myself to have more access to power, mm. right? So if whiteness is the standard of power, then for black people, the whiter I look, maybe. And again, it's not about, it, it, there is correlation. We do have statistics to say that yes, it's real, right? It's not made up, but it is to say that even just on the possibility, it's not guaranteed, just on the hope, that I can access this power. I will change all these things about myself. You've got women all over the world, not just black women, Asian women, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. even European, like women bleaching their skin because the ideal of beauty has been positioned as light. So if I can mm -hmm. do something about it, I will. Hair, I'm gonna straighten my hair because if we position the white woman as the pinnacle of beauty, I don't stand a chance. There's, again, how does white supremacy train you to see things? I'm gorgeous. But if white supremacy tells you that I'm not, that's how you move. You're not even able to see it. I've had this conversation as a dark-skinned woman in dating situations, right? That having partners say things as if it's just the way it is, you know? Or I know being younger and being completely annoyed by whomever, I'm not gonna put anybody's name out there, but whatever light-skinned black woman character was in whatever movie or TV show and everybody falling all over themselves, she's so pretty. And I'm like, what are you looking at? Like she's light-skinned, but like her features, she's not really bringing anything. Um, I see this woman on, at the bus stop, you know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing regal or magical about her. She's just light-skinned. Or having light-skinned friends, women friends say to me that, Men try to holler at them from a distance. You can't see my face. You don't know if I have teeth in my mouth. You don't know anything about me. All you see is my skin and you equate that with beauty, right? So when I do work on body politics, it is to say that it is so much more than preference because that's the other thing that comes up when we have this conversation. You'll hear somebody say, well, I just prefer, you know, light skin is just my preference or I just like women with longer hair. That's just my preference. And there's a very fine line between preference and pathology. Mm. How did you come to, to get go that down preference? That road. How did you go come to get that, that preference? Yep. Somebody trained you to think that was, like, again, this is what I'm saying about white supremacy. It robs us of our ability to think critically. We just take the script and roll with it, and it's not true. And so when I how hear many white people, people hmm? Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. No, I, no, it's like, how many, white people, how many white people have said in their life, I'm not attracted to, to black people? Right? I'm just not attracted to black people. It's just not a part of, that's not my preference. That's actually, I mean, it's, this is, this is like, this is the stuff that we Which again, it's fine. Say. It's fine. You don't have to be attracted to black people. That wouldn't make you not racist either. You see what I'm saying? Like, I want us right. to also be clear, right? Because I should also be able to say I'm not attracted to white men and it not mean anything mm -hmm. other than I'm not. Right? This is mm -hmm. not about creating mm -hmm. a system where now we all got to get along and everybody's beautiful and we love everybody and we've created this loving world. That's that surface fake. That's not what we talk. The real work is to think critically about why you do the things you do, why you think the way you do. Yes. That's it. And you make peace with it from there. Yes. But if you don't dig into it and you don't think critically, you don't get to say that's just the way it is because you haven't even thought about it. Think about it. If you still mm -hmm. come up with that answer, that's cool. But you got to think critically about it. It came from somewhere. And nine times out of 10, most of us have this great, you know, awakening. Like, oh, my God, that's where that comes from. Yes. I mean, right now, I can't stop coming across it, right? Like, I can't stop. Un I, now that I know how to think, 
Because that's what I think you're saying is that learning how to think critically and what to think about allows the unraveling of this white supremacy inside my own being. Um, and it's still, you know, I'm still unraveling. I'm still trying to do this kind of work. But once you learn it, you can't unlearn it. And so you start seeing things and you start, you know, I have a tendency to, to beat myself up uh, about some of this, not just this, but everything. And it's like, gosh, I can't believe that you even thought that way or you felt that way or that you could even perceive it to be. But like you said, of course you do. <laughs> Why wouldn't yes. you? And that's yes. what I'm saying, like that beating up stuff. We don't have time for that, Abby. You're wasting time. You just got to accept. Totally. You just got to accept yes. that you got here because of white supremacy. You got here because yeah. of white privilege. You got here because of a particular trajectory of your life. There wasn't anything necessarily alone before you knew, right? Because that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Now that your eyes are open, you don't get to close them again. But yeah. all that time that you didn't know, what were you supposed to do? What in your life was happening that would have pushed you and said, this is wrong, change. Something would have had to happen because your normal supports white supremacy. Totally, status it, it quo. Just like, let's just, yep, yep, let's let just try to keep things all the same. Absolutely. Let it go. All right, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit. We got about 15 minutes left um, okay. or however long you have. But last week you in Toronto, you guys were talking about how it's important for white women to to both know when to step aside and for black women to teach and when to step up and do the work for themselves so that black women aren't caring at all i just want to know because you're getting inundated with this i want to know when white women should step up because let's say they've done this work when white women should start actually asking questions stepping up and then how to do that. Yeah, I think, again, this moment has us all antsy and people are just jumping so quickly, right, to want to reach out and get the answers. I mean, the most simplest basic answer is like, y'all have, we didn't have Google. <laughs> y'all have Google. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying go to Google to get answers. I'm saying go to Google to search for top 10 books of 2019 on racism, right? Mm -hmm. Or there are all kinds of lists on the internet about best you know books on how book look at the new york times bestseller list which is interesting right last with right now y'all go look at that list right now and get all those books read mm -hmm. one of those books before you reach out to anybody it's different if you're coming from a space of some level of something don't come to me completely cobwebs in your head and think i'm supposed to teach you starts because to me that shows your investment because again what's in it for me why should I help you get out of my DMs? Get out of my email. Unless you're inviting me to come speak to a group of people and you're paying me. Unless you're positioning in something that has some value for me. Because again, yes, I'm doing work for my people. Yes, I'm doing work that is anti-racist. Yes, I want to change this. But your one little DM and me helping you don't make me feel like I changed the world. Right. Do your work. Well. Yeah, and you just said the word, the word anti-racist, and that's, I think, the number one book on, on Amazon bestsellers right now is how to be an anti-racist. And I think that that word is the word that I am trying to embody the most. And what I've been trying to do is to go through the entirety of my life, so not just personal, but also professional, and figure out what are ways that I'm contributing to white supremacy? What are ways am I holding back black people, women of color um, from the conversation, from the platform, from the environments that would then at some, hopefully some point, level the wealth gap, level things. You know, maybe it takes way beyond our lifetime. Sure, to get sure, there. sure. But you contribute to it. I, I get it. Right, totally. And so I've been kind of deconstructing my life um, not just, like I said, professionally and personally, but like the whole thing. And some of these non-negotiables, like that's what Glenn and I talk about. Um, what are our family's non-negotiables? And um, I think that, you know, there was this good, there's this great post, things that you can do on a, on, a, on a daily basis to ensure that you are walking in the direction of being or becoming anti-racist. Because for white folks, and this is a truth, 
it's scary to lose power, right? For us. Like that is the reason why all, like that's the truth. That's why this is taking so long. That's why white people won't do the work. That's why white people are terrified to do the work because when you want to get, give away some power, that means you will lose something. Mm -hmm. And I think on a really deep level, um, I think that we're just scared, scared of that really happening. Of course you when are. You, yes. And, and for me that, you know, I'm in a privileged position that, that I don't feel as scared um, as maybe another person would in a different situation. But what I do know is that that is the human contract that I made that starting this work is like, Hey, I, if, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be not just an ally, but an accomplice to making sure that you, that every black woman that I come in contact with, that I can look you square in the eyes and say, I'm doing my work. I'm doing the best that I can. And I'm trying, right, to help. What are ways that we can specifically help you in your life and in your career? Not to be the white savior, not to be the, the, the people that can fix you, but I want, I want my followers and people to know what we can do for black women right now, specifically. More generally, I would say that the hashtag share the mic campaign was one reflection or one example, perhaps. Um, and, and just as a metaphor, not just on Instagram, but in life, right? So if in your office, let's say, you got two black women who are there, right? And you are the head of whatever, and you know that you're going to be leading this big meeting, step aside and invite them to take the face, maybe, right? I like this concept of sharing the mic. I like this concept of even when you and I connected, you saying, I'm going to get out of your way. Let's mm -hmm. use that as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. Yeah. When you know that Black folk, well, and you might not know. Let's just say, take my word for it, right? <laughs> Good, yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> Put black people um, at the fore. But again, it's hard and it's difficult because I also don't want to like, and I think that's what people struggle with last week with the share the mic concept. It's like this notion of on the one hand, like I said earlier, we, some of us don't have cable. We create our new media, our own media. We don't need white media. So we don't need you for nothing. We got it, right? There's something that's also offensive and we feel offended at the idea that I even got to come to you like so, that I even have to take you know what I mean? The open door that you give me. But at the same time, as we recognize things as they are, if you give me the mic, I'm going to take it. If you give me a seat at the table, I'm going to take it. And when I take it, this is the other thing that I'm saying to us. Don't squander that opportunity now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they gave you the opportunity to talk, talk. This is not mm -hmm. about making people feel comfortable or that mm -hmm. you're friends. Speak mm -hmm. the truth, ultimately. Like, we need truth tellers out here. And we need yeah. the opportunity to tell our truth. We don't want to be policed. We don't want to be scripted. I can't tell you how many times I've been in situations, even with Black folks, especially with Black folks, right? When we think of nonprofits, when we think of uh, media organizations that have big money coming from white foundations, and then you come with this brilliant idea of how we're going to put Black people at the center, and their concern is the money, and mm -hmm. so though I have a message for black people that I want to give, I'm supposed to measure that because ultimately I got to make white people comfortable. That's, that's no, get out of the way. We need white people to say, you know what? Here's the money. It needs to be done. You don't have to ask me nothing. I'm not checking in. I trust you. If mm. you know what needs to be said, say it. But I'm not going to mm -hmm. insert myself because cause the other thing in all the dynamics, as much as you talk about, oh, we're scared of being called racist. Some of y'all are scared of being called, dare I say, radical, dare right. I say, revolutionary. And that's why that's I, I, posted, I think I posted this in the judgment free zone that I did on your stories last week. That's why I don't even eat Ben and Jerry's. But Ben and Jerry's is all right with me. You know why? Because yeah. their mm -hmm. statement went hard in the paint. Their statement mm -hmm. was like white supremacy, you know, there's so many memes about how like Ben and Jerry's is coming into the space whereby all these other com uh, companies are tiptoeing around it. You know, mm -hmm. can't we all get along type of rhetoric? And Ben and Jerry's is like, yo, this is white supremacy and we're not here for it. We yep. want to support, that's, that's what I mean by accomplice. 
Yep. Be that white person. Yes. Recognize that we need people in power to support, to trust that we know what we're talking. We are the ones who are living this life and being oppressed by this system. Trust us when we say it. Support oh, us so that we can do it. And so, so for me, it's like, get out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it is um, to support financially, but don't think that that financial support takes you off the hook. It just means that you put five on it. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mean that. Because the other <laughs> thing that's happening, the other thing that's happening is understand that Yaba Blay is not pay-per-view. This is not transactional. Just because you gave me $20 doesn't mean I owe you an answer to anything. I don't work for you. Mm -hmm. If you're going to give me the money because you want to support the work that I do, drop the dollars and go away. Mm-hmm. It doesn't I make love us it. friends. It doesn't mean I like you. It doesn't, it doesn't, you, because that's capitalist thinking. You think this money, you now deserve or you earn something. Let me say this, Abby. White people, you haven't earned our grace. Mm -hmm. You haven't earned our respect. Mm -hmm. Earn it. Ugh. Do the work to earn it. We don't mm. have to. You haven't so earned it. That makes me feel a lot. And I think that that is a reckoning for all white people that we have to be able to sit with that. And, you know, you talk about the word trust and, and we'll let this be the last little conversation we have for this hour. You know, Bose, um, Bozema St. John, she is one of the leaders who um, organized Share the Mic Now campaign last week. and when we started this conversation and early conversations, um, she said, listen, trust has to be built upon relationships. And she brought, she and Lovey were the women who found the black women and Glennon and Stacy were the women who found the white women to join together and to create this amazing campaign. And I think very deeply about this word trust because I can understand why every black person in the world would not trust a single white person. Duh, right? <laughs> but I, but here's, here's what I have to say about that. It is possible to start the process of earning trust with individual black women from a white person's perspective. And that is by getting in relationship with them. By genuine, them. genuine relationship. Not yes. because you're trying to feel better today. Not yes. because you need somebody to parade around and say, see, I have a black friend. Yeah. Genuine relations. And I said this to y'all, and I'll say this to everybody else. When we had our debrief, I said, I know we're proud of the group and what we did with this campaign, but I need y'all to clap for me because understand, y'all don't have white people in her intimate circle. Y'all mm -hmm. doesn't actually, I don't have white friends. Like, I have white colleagues. I have white people that, you know, we're cool. And we, you know, kick it when we see each other. But like our kids not playing together. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just how black I was raised and socialized. Right. Um, so for me to say, quite honestly, like, I feel like you're my friend, Abby, is because you did things to make me feel like you were genuinely trying to be my friend. This was not and I, and I, and I, and I can't speak for all the other parents in the campaign, but you know, Toronto feels the same way about Glenning. Like you, you, you're doing what you value. You're showing me, you are showing me that you are trying to get it. You want to work beyond the campaign. You said to me, even when this is done, let's talk. What do you need? Yes. yes. Genuine, not just, I need a black friend, not just, I need some way to feel better and prove that, you know, I'm, cause again, it's that shame piece. So it could be that kind of thinking, well, well, if I can make a black friend, then I'm different than everybody else. You right. know what I mean? Like build genuine relationships and build relationships in such a way that black folks get more out of the relationship than you do. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, it reminds me, you know, Glenn and I are both sober. And so the way that we have built the foundation of our relationship and our marriage and our family um, relationship is built upon values, right? And something you just said just really rang true um, is 
whatever you spend your time doing is really what you value. Mm -hmm. So some people, right, they say, oh, I value my family. But then they spend their whole life at work, right? <laughs> Do you really value your family? And then people who are doing this work, I value black lives, black lives matter, right? Well, what are you actually doing to prove on a daily basis that it, it does matter to you, right? Are you donating? Are you educating? Are you marching? Are you protesting? Like, those are just like real simple things that you can do and not tell anybody about it. Right. And this is the other thing. This is what I really want to say. We don't need y'all out in quote unquote diverse spaces. We don't need you showing yourself out in the world like, look at me, I'm not a racist. We need you to have a conversation at the Thanksgiving coffee table when your racist ass uncle is saying crazy stuff. We need you to check him. We need you to talk to your own people because yes. they're going to listen to you. We need you, Abby, to say to your folks like, yo, this is how I get down or I'm not yeah. into that. We need you to check your own people so we don't have to. Like I had a, 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 I had a company reach out to me. They're doing, and I can't say, but they're doing something big. They know that the community is gonna respond to it. They wanted me to consult with them about how to approach the programming. And I said, the people who are gonna come to programming are gonna be the people who are resisting this thing, which means they're likely people who are racist. I'm not putting myself in front of them for you. Get somebody white to do that. Mm. Talk to your own people. Yes. It could be a train it's the so trainers good. kind of thing. I can come train you how to mm -hmm. talk to your people, but you are responsible for having that conversation at the, t at the dinner table. You're responsible for checking the other parents who are talking crazy about, about black kids or, or black teeth, wherever it is. If that's your mm -hmm. job, you're responsible yes. for white people. I'm not responsible for oh. y'all. I love that. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our job as white women now to not center ourselves. That's been something that I've been reckoning because added to the fact that I have this white supremacy and white privilege, I also have on top of it, a whole big dollop of a little bit of fame and, um, Just and a little bit recognition, <laughs> you know? So like that compounded, I have a problem a little bit with centering my own self just because I got a healthy ego on my shoulders. Um, <laughs> but taking us and ourselves out of that equation, I think has been really helpful for me. I mean, Glennon, she's, she points it out now because I told her, I was like, I need you to point out when I'm centering myself and she's been pointing it out. It's like, Oh wow. Like having somebody close to me who I trust, who can check me and hold me accountable for some of these things that, have become such a, a habit in my life um, is really helpful. I mean, listen, I know that I don't want to take any more of your, your time. You are- You're not taking my time. We're talking. You, but oh, we might Glennon get cut off. Say hi. Glennon wants Who's to that? say Who's hi really quick. Who's that? Who's that? Hi, Glennon. Okay. I've been just out there listening to every word of this. Real You're hard so not cute. to comment. Real hard You're not so to comment. so cute. Um, I mean, look how beautiful she looks. I just- I just want, that's because you've been trained to see me as the <laughs> pinnacle of white supremacist beauty. Yes, beauty. Glennon. Tell that, her. Right. That's because I spent the first 40 years of my life trying to match that mold, and it worked for me, and now I'm done with it. But um, I just want to tell you, too, that I've never seen, usually with IG Lives, people, you know, they drop off, drop off, drop off. More people kept joining and stayed the whole time. You two, that was, you, <clears throat> so good. So good. Okay, that's all. I just love you. You're so freaking smart and fierce and wonderful. And I just can't wait to le learn from you for the rest of my life. Aww. Okay, bye. Glennon, bye. <laughs> bye, love. <laughs> she, she's the dearest. <laughs> she's just, she's the, she is something else. I tell yeah, you she is. yeah, she is. Yes, she is. And she and Toronto will be in conversation as we are um, this this evening. So I'm yes. um, I'm excited to see them work it out too. Yeah, five thirty. I think it's on Glennon's um, IG. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Blay, I yeah. am the one that is so grateful um, for our. I mean, it was just kind of luck that we got paired together. Uh, but I'm so grateful because something that I am going to hold my um, agency, my people to is trying to get us on a stage somewhere. There we go. I, 
Um, I believe deeply uh, that this is, this is the very beginning of something beautiful that's going to continue to grow. Um, so I'm saying it to my folks, like I'm holding myself to account here that I really, I'm so grateful that for the labor that you put in last Wednesday, because I know that that was a really hard, long day. Um, I hope that I can just keep learning from you and keep um, exploring this whole new definition of white supremacy that you have just dropped uh, on my little lap over here, given me so much to think about and just different contexts. I mean, to bring the context that you not only brought to this conversation, but bring to the world is going to save people's lives. And, um, and it's going to save my life from my own self and my own conditioning. Mm -hmm. You are truly um, a blessing. You mm -hmm. are a gift to this world. And I am honored that we got paired together, honored to, to share this hour with you. Thank you so much. I love you. I and love you too. Thank you. I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait to talk next. Maybe we can make this a monthly thing. I don't want to like, waste your time, but I'm down. Um, I just, I value you but so much. But white people got to pay. Yeah, let's go. Let's go, <laughs> white folks. Let's go. I'll pay you. Shit. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> all right, Dr. Thank White. You, Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much. Have of a good course. rest of your day. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye.